Welcome to our backyard. I'm Dr. Russ and this is just one more Dr. Russ Air Rifle Adventures. Uh, today I'm going to show you my seven best accuracy tips in shooting the Gamo Maxim Swarm 10X rifle. I think you'll find it interesting. At the same time, keep in mind that if you'd like to see some additional videos to help you with accuracy, pellets, etc., click onto that oval circle that's uh, somewhere on your screen, and uh, that'll give you access to our 40 plus videos that are out there. I think that you'll find them have, uh, uh, helpful. Uh, let's just get right to these seven tips. The first tip is all about how you hold the gun in the correct position. Now, this left elbow is typically tucked in to your side. It gives great support when it's tucked into the side. This elbow can be out, in this example, towards you. And that provides where the two hands go. It didn't talk about what they hold. This forward piece has to be very, very loose in what we call the artillery position because the gun wants to do this and it has to slip. If I'm holding it five pounds, you're holding it 10 pounds, we're both holding it too tight. When we get to use a gun rest like I have behind me here, I like it to sit on that and just do itself. I then focus back here on the back. Uh, because I want this gun to be loose. Why? Well, the gun does in its, uh, when it's brake barrel or a springer, it likes to do this. And we've got to get this word consistency into our accuracy. If we don't have consistency, we're not gonna be accurate. So if I'm holding it with five pound grip and the next time it's a six pound, the next time it's a four pound, I'm gonna get different accuracy. So it's got to be completely loose to get consistency, and that's our first step towards accuracy. The second tip to good accuracy is to have consistent pellets. Consistent pellets. Man, are they different. They're different in actually their width. Uh, 22 might be 22.4, 22.6. So we want to get down to one pellet that does the best at closing the gap, not getting too tight in there, of course, and having to be rammed out, but the right pellet. And we begin with washing them. I know you think, are you kidding me? No, just get a strainer, use some Dawn dish soap, anything your mother uses to wash the dishes your wife uses. And that has a grease cutter in it, and that gets the pellets and all the little particles off. Now, it's important. You know, those particles drop down and into the mechanism of your gun. Pretty soon, <laughs> your gun isn't gonna work anymore. Particularly if it gets down into those air passages. So we want clean pellets, and they're not so clean. You'll find out the first time you wash pellets. After we get them washed and let them dry on a, a towel of some sort, then we wanna lube them. I didn't say oil them, I didn't say put Vaseline in the back of them and make them diesel. I said a thick oil. Now thick oil clings to the pellet and just like a piston in an engine needs oil to get uh, the best compression possible, uh, we need that in a, in a pellet. I'm constantly asked, what, what pellet uh, oil do you use, lube? Well, I wish there was some Rush Jones Air Adventure pellet. There is not. Uh, this is chain wax. This is a thick lube, and it's found at motorcycle shops. This uh, clings to the chain of a motorcycle, so you don't throw up this grease line on the back of a rider uh, or the driver of a motorcycle. It, the chain needs to be lubed. It also needs to stick to that flying chain. This works pretty good. Uh, another one here uh, is just in an automotive store, spray lube. Uh, you'll also find fogging oil. I've used fogging oil, can of fogging oil. And uh, you can go to a gun shop and get 
bullet lube. Yeah, we put lube on bullets too so that they consistently slip down that barrel. Uh, maximizing compression, but also maximizing velocity and the energy. So a light spray onto the uh, pellets and uh, then you put it back into a tin. I like a kind of a sponge or a piece of cloth there that can absorb any excess oil. And uh, I would say <laughs> after that, you may want to store the guns upside down with the barrels down, just in case there is some oil there, it'll drain towards the end of the barrel and not back down into that gun. So that's important. If it does, at least it's not taking pellet particles with it. You've got to inspect those pellets. What are we inspecting them for? Uh, first of all, they're designed like these over here, much like a birdie on a game of badminton. The heavy lead in the front goes first, and on a birdie, you know, these are feathers, and they create what's called a drag. That keeps the back of it behind it and the heavy pellet in front of it. Well, that's, that's all important. But what else is important? is that that little oval on the back is still a perfect circle. Uh, you'll see some squashed, some that are crinkly. You don't want that in your barrel. That allows that air to escape around it. So find those with nice round circle skirts, we call it, on the back. Thirdly, what type do you want to shoot? <laughs> well, believe it or not, this flat nose wad cutter might actually be the best, uh, most accurate pellet there is. This is what they use in competitions. Uh, why they use it in competitions is it cuts nice round holes into that target so that we can see if it actually touched the bullseye line or not. Uh, so they use almost exclusively a wad cutter here for accuracy in air gun competition, which is always at 10 yards. The hunter is a sharp nose. Now there's a small problem with hunters that they look like they would work. Oh, a nice sharp point hits the side of an animal, go through it. We get two bleeding holes. Now we get two uh, ways to track the animal. But that sharp nose has a way of hitting air and getting a little wobbly. That's not good. The hollow head does exactly the same thing. You know, one of the best selling pellets out there is uh, by Benjamin called uh, the Hollowhead uh, Premier. And that's got the tiniest little dimp you've ever, dimple you've ever seen in it. And I think that's why it's the number one seller. It doesn't have this big cavity in it that can create a, like a parachute effect and get that pellet uh, wavering in the wind. Which one do I use? called a round pellet or a dome pellet but here's all this nice round weight goes to the wind consistently and finds its way to the target so this is uh, what I mean when I say consistent pellets wash them lube them inspect them and then use one whichever one you're going to use try that in several brands to find the one that fits that barrel the best and goes down that barrel consistently. My third tip for game air rifles is the way you squeeze that trigger. Now I have to tell you that there's a dozen ways to wrap your finger in and out of that trigger guard and squeeze that trigger. You say, I, I squeeze it carefully. That's not the secret. Imagine for a moment that we stuck a pencil inside and we're pulling this pencil straight back. Not a finger, a pencil. And how consistent that would be on that trigger. Well, that's what we want to accomplish, except we can't go hunting with pencils in our hand or out to competitive events with pencils. So we have to train our trigger finger to do something it's just not normally ready to do. And that is that we stick this finger in and we're pulling this back. And that's a kind of an abnormal uh, movement of the finger, but that's the only one that will consistently 
pull that trigger back. Now, it also helps if we have a light trigger and there are some screws that are accessed through these holes behind that trigger. Your manual will tell you about them. One allows the first stage, which is the, the real easy pull to get it back, getting ready to, to fire. Uh, that's just kind of a, a, a readiness uh, pull, if you will, stage one. But then when we get it back to getting some resistance, that's the one I'm really worried about. That's the one, and the one you'll hear most is about a two pound pull. Uh, but it's very light. Some people go clear to a one pound. Now you should know, the more lightness that you have, and you throw this gun down somewhere, it can go off. I, uh, I worked for, uh, in the grocery store for Kroger. I was a manager in trainee. And the manager took me pheasant hunting. We took our two shotguns and he also wanted to show off his brand new Ford, this 30, 40 years ago. We hunted, we came back to the Ford. I'm there on one side, he's on the driver's side. He opens up the back door and throws his shotgun in onto that uh, seat. And when it went there, it fired right, pellets right through the door, missing me, but right by me. He had a very light trigger. We don't want to go that light, but the trigger pull, get it adjusted just for you. So we're correctly holding the rifle. We're washing and inspecting the pellets. And then we're going to use the correct pellets uh, in our air rifle consistently, also lubing them. Uh, we're also going to squeeze the trigger almost as if our finger was a pencil. Number five is our breathing. Let's pretend this is the bullseye, whether it's on an animal, a, a target, whatever. And let's pretend these are the crosshairs of our gun. And as we um, sit there and look through the scope, in this example, I'll talk about iron sights in a minute, we're breathing. And typically, imagine that uh, that's the bullseye, but the, the whole target, squirrel, whatever it is, is this big. Uh, that we want in our breathing that we're covering the target with our crosshairs. And we, we get this breathing down to just covering the animal. Two, three, four breaths, and we see that's correct. And now it's ready to shoot. And we take in our air and we let out one third of our breath. And when you let out one third of your breath, you'll come in on this bullseye and then you'll squeeze the trigger correctly, etc. But it's this breathing that we want it to work for us and not against us. We don't use this word, oh, I had a flyer. <laughs> if you use my seven tips, you won't have flyers. Uh, flyers are mistakes. Let's also kind of look at the iron sights, if you will. <laughs> this is the back of a gun. This is the front. We call this sight picture pumpkin on a post. And what we want is this front sight, which can do all kinds of goofy things. We want it to be flat with these rear posts, and we want it in the center and we want the exact bullet to be sitting on top of that. Maybe it's just like that to get it into that bullseye, but whatever we know, we know it's gonna be just coming in the top of that. That's why we call it pumpkin on a post. Some guns have uh, uh, a hole in the back, a circular rear target, but it still has this front post. And what we want is to look through this circular aperture on the back so that it comes in and we're doing this again. We're seeing that pumpkin on a post inside this aperture. That's the third sight picture that you want. <coughs> and the fourth would be if we have a red dot. And this red dot on the gun is going to do exactly the same thing when we're breathing. 
And when we take in our air and we let out a third, we want this red dot to fit right on top of that bullseye. And that's when we squeeze the trigger. Let me say something about the scope and sight pictures. Imagine your scope is here and the barrel is right below it. It's very important when you sight in the gun and then when you're making that shot uh, at competition or hunting, you want that scope to be directly above this. Imagine holding the gun a little bit like this. And we now have to use some adjustments due to wind, etc. And that's what we're going to be talking about here next. We have really screwed up what this gun can do. And it'll look like we're shooting flyers again. So some scopes have a, uh, a, a bubble right here. You can put bubblers on it here. Uh, you'll find them at tool stores. Uh, it's important to build a house perpendicular and horizontal important to shoot a gun that way too. So uh, we want that sight picture to be just right. Now as we practice, you want to practice all the time. I've had people say, Russ, I can't go with you today. It's too windy. We need to practice in the wind. We need to practice in the wind because maybe that trophy deer, that big red squirrel, something is in a, out there on hunt day and the wind is blowing 10 miles an hour this way. If I practice in wind, I can know exactly where to put those crosshairs for that distance. So wind is good. Practicing in wind is good. Practicing in rain is good. When you get out there hunting, you say, I got this handled. I know just what to do. Uh, practicing even in the snow. Uh, these are all things that make you a better shot in the end. Now, for those of you who say, you know, practicing gets boring. It doesn't have to be boring. Let me show you what I mean. If you get tired of shooting at bullseye targets, you can get what we call practical shooting targets. Try to hit this guy here without hitting her. <laughs> Boy, did the score go against you if you hit her. If you just nick her ear, for example the scoring can go bad. So the question is, how do we hit this guy when these targets here come a little boring to us? These are available on the internet and at gun stores. You can find them. Here's an interesting target I had to make myself. But uh, imagine being on that SEAL team and some security guards get in front of Osama bin Laden and this is the guy you're after. So trying to get him and not let these men defuse the bullet. Uh, so sometimes you have to make your own, and that's okay too. Now here's one more, also on the internet, available gun stores. But trying to hit this guy in the throat, in the head, eyes, whatever, without hitting her. Hit his hand, hit his shoulder, whirl him that way, just to let this girl escape. We can make target practicing very, very interesting. One of the nice things about these Gamo 10X is this accessory up here allows you to shoot 10 just as fast as you can. So, not as fast as I can, but I've got 10 targets down there. Let's see how I do. My seventh accuracy tip for the Gamo rifle is one that I call two bullseyes for the price of one. Here's your gun. Notice that the rifle is two inches below the scope and the rifle shoots pellets, even real powder bullets, high and then they ultimately drift back, gravity pulling them to the ground. 
but the scope completely unforgiving it shows a straight line into infinity so we're trying to get these two to do the same thing to pinpoint a bullet or pellet right on the bullseye what I mean when I say two bullseyes for the price of one is that a lot of pellet guns if you sight them in for around 30 yards, 25 yards, 35 yards, whatever, and you sight in for a bullseye, this is the side of a target, and you get that into a bullseye, you're gonna find out that around 60, 65, 70 yards, it's coming back down and right through the same bullseye. That's what I mean. You're gonna get two bullseyes for the price of one. In the middle, 40, 45, 50 yards, depending on the caliber and the uh, velocity, you'll be shooting high. That's why <laughs> you need to aim low. So now we'll put the scope somewhere down here so that the bullet comes through here if we saw that we're shooting somewhere in the middle there, 45 or 50 yards. Way out here at 90 yards, the bullet begins dropping pretty fast. I shot an antelope once at 454 yards. I was using one of the most powerful rifles you could. It was a 338 Magnum. The bullet was over 3,000 feet a second. And uh, a 10 mile an hour wind was crossing the field. My brand new wife, Dr. Paula, was with me and I had to impress her. So I aimed out in front of the nose of this antelope who was broadside and then 14 inches high and fired. And when that pellet came, the wind brought it into the pellet and the bullet dropped and blew out its heart in one shot. That's really the type of accuracy you wanna get here. How much is it dropping and how much does the wind affect it? And if you just have this in your mind, this drawing, whatever these numbers are, should be taped right onto your stock of your hunting rifle so that you can look okay and shoot you might want to take a range finder with you or be really good at estimating ranges well these are the seven tips that i have for you today to make your gamo swarm 10x rifle just as accurate as possible make you accurate too uh we hope that you'll give us a thumbs up we hope that you subscribe we hope that you'll uh, click onto that little circle uh, photo of me and you'll access our whole library of uh, tips, all of which are designed to keep you air gun sharp. <laughs>